Suspense. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Mr. Van Heflin in Murder of Antelia, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Oh, Mr. Wilcox, Mr. Wilcox. Well, Hap's sister-in-law, what brings you here? Oh, I just stopped by to tell you Hap has a nasty cold and he can't get started. Cold? Started? Mm -hmm. Say, he should switch to Autolite resistor spark plugs. These wide gap wonders get your car going faster in cold temperatures. Save gas, too, because they make your engine run smoother on leaner gas mixtures. Oh, well, Hap says he's not long for this world. <laughs> long? Autolite resistor spark plugs give him up to 200% longer electrode life. And Autolite's exclusive built-in 10,000 ohm resistor cuts down spark plug interference with radio and television, too. So tell him to see his neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer and have him install a set of wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. He'll feel better because his car will run better. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with Murder of Aunt Delia, and with the performance of Van Heflin, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in... Suspense! Ever stick out your thumb and pull out a million-dollar plum? Well, I'm the little Jack Horner that did that. Only my name isn't Horner, it's Dort Sharples. I was hitchhiking along Highway 70 across the Arizona desert, heading for L.A. It was August, and it was hot. The lizards were fanning themselves. There wasn't much traffic, and nobody had stopped. I'd walked about eight miles outside some little burg, and I was tired and sore. Finally, a black sedan came along. I was all set to holler cuss words at him for not stopping, when suddenly he slowed down. He was a young guy about my age. He was alone. Hop in. Well, thanks. I... Well, I sure appreciate this. It's all right. I could use some company. For a second there, I I didn't think you were going to stop. I wasn't, frankly. Well, a guy has to be kind of careful, I guess, huh? You know what changed my mind? <laughs> Maybe you won't like this, but well, it suddenly struck me that you look like me. Yeah? Yeah, I guess maybe I do at that now that you mention it. I thought to myself, what if that was me walking along? Besides, if you've got a face like mine, it must be an honest face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you got something there. You going to Blythe? Uh, where's that? Uh, the next town, across the Colorado. No, I'm going clear into L.A. Well, I happen to be going through there on my way to Santa Barbara. If you want to spell me at the wheel, we can make Los Angeles by a little after midnight. Brother, you got yourself a co-pilot. <laughs> By the time we crossed the river into California, I'd learned that the guy's name was Glendon Braley, that he was going to visit his invalid aunt. This aunt didn't own all of Santa Barbara, not quite. The guy didn't volunteer this information. I had to probe it out of him. Between Blythe and Desert Center, an idea began to percolate. And not just from the heat, either. I bet your aunt will be glad to see you, Braley. How long did you say it's been? Well, I was ten when I left... That'd make it 17 years. You see, my mother died when I was three, and Aunt Delia took me in. Oh, does she know you're coming? I sent her a wire. Uh, you think she'll recognize you? I doubt it. The reason I'm going back, her husband died about a month ago. He and I never got along. That's why I left Aunt Delia's place. You mean you ran off? No, uh, another aunt in Delaware took me. And then, what with school and then the army and getting a job afterwards, well, I, I just lost track of Aunt Delia. Uh, hey, you got a lot of relatives in the East? No. My other aunt died when I was 21. Deja is the only relative I've got left. Well, I guess that means you're coming to something pretty good someday. Yeah, huh? I suppose so. It's funny, but the idea sort of scares me. Oh, boy, I wish somebody scared me like that. <laughs> <laughs> I kept pumping him until I could have written his autobiography. Yes, I mean autobiography. I stored away facts about this uncle that he hated, about how Braley used to like to draw pictures when he was a kid, about how he got his only spanking when he was eight for spilling ink on his aunt's favorite tapestry, how he couldn't eat peas, how he got sick on enchiladas at the Santa Barbara Fiesta in 1929, everything. Could I remember it? <laughs> well, people used to tell me with my memory I, I could have been a lawyer. But that takes work. Just east of Indio, before Highway 70 runs into 99, I figured that I was thoroughly briefed. 
Want me to drive a while, Sharples? No, thanks, unless you want to take over. No, technically, maybe I shouldn't be driving at all. Oh, I've got one of these mail-order driver's licenses, but I doubt if I can pass the California test. You see, Hey, I you don't... know it's something funny? Huh? I think we're getting a flat. Oh, rats. Yeah, the car ride's kind of funny. I, I think it's the left rear tire. Oh, this would have to happen clear out in the middle of nowhere. Well, we better stop and take a look, huh? I don't even know if the spare's any good. Of course, I may be imagining things, but we better make sure. I'll check it. Well, there's not a soul in sight either way. Oh, well, we won't need any help. I hope not. How is it? Maybe you better come and look. Okay. Say, come to think of it, there may not be any tools in the car. I bought it in a hurry off a used car lot. Well, I've got all the tools that I'll need, really. All right. It doesn't look flat to me. No? Look close. Well, it still doesn't <laughs> seem... I was right about the tools, wasn't I, Fraley? <laughs> I put the blackjack back in my pocket and I dragged Braley off the highway into a ditch. I made sure he was dead. Then I changed clothes with him and covered his body with sand and brush. I was back in the sedan and on my way and still no other car was in sight. I adjusted the rearview mirror so that I could see my reflection. I watched the lips move as my voice said, Dort Sharples? Never heard of him. My name's Glendon Braley. I pulled into L.A. about 2 a.m. I waited till morning, though, before I went to Rena Zita's apartment. I wanted her to be wide awake when I told her my idea. But, Dort, it sounds crazy and dangerous. Well, for a million bucks, we can afford to be crazy. Yeah, poor somebody finds out that you aren't this guy. Who'll know? His aunt hasn't seen him since he was a kid. There are no other relatives, no connections on the coast, or back east for that matter. But are you sure you can carry it off, Dora? Listen, Rena, I know everything about this guy, even when, he, even when he lost his first baby tooth. What do you want me to do? Just stay where I can get in touch with you. Be ready to come on up to Santa Barbara. How long will you have to wait to come into this money? The old lady may live for years. I don't think so. She's pretty well along. She's an invalid. You know, a lot of things can happen to an old lady. Well... No, no, it's a real break. I might have done it alone, kid, but I thought of you. Well, it's real sweet of you, Dorothy. Real sweet. Then we're partners? Okay, Dor. Great, kid. But now look, you get in the habit of calling me Glendon Braley. <laughs> Kiss me, Glenn. It didn't take me long to cover the hundred miles to Santa Barbara. The reunion with Aunt Delia was quite touching. I sat on a low stool right by her wheelchair, drinking tea that her housekeeper, Mrs. Parker, kept pouring. And uh, we talked over old times. Oh, Glenny, it's so good to have you home again. Glenny. Nobody but you ever called me that. The kids always called me Glenn or Curly, mostly. (laughs) And how angry you used to get. You hated to be called Curly. (laughs) Yeah, and and, uh, when I got in a fight about that with... uh, Pudge Mossman, you, you sent me to bed without any supper. <laughs> and uh, then you took away my paints and crayons for a whole week. Not a whole week, Lenny. I relented on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> well, I, it, it seemed like a week. <laughs> you did love to draw. Oh, uh, that must be Mr. Crittenden. Uh, Crittenden? Yes, uh, my attorney. He's been just wonderful to me since your uncle died. Handles all of my affairs. I've asked him to come up to meet you. Oh, I hope you don't mind. No, not at all, Andy. That's all right, Mr. Parker, don't bother. Come right in, Bryce. Hello, Delia. Ah, you look positively radiant. Oh. <laughs> well, well, well. Is this the prodigal nephew? Yes, Bryce. This is Glenny. Or should I say, Mr. Crittenden, my nephew, Glendon Braley. How do you do, sir? How do you do? So, this is Glenny. <laughs> well, my boy, let me warn you that I know every infamous detail of your crime ridden career. That is, up until the time you were ten years old. No, please. <laughs> I'm afraid, Annie, that Mr. Crittenden has a, a, a ipso facto case against me. <laughs> no, I, I offer this tapestry on the wall as Exhibit A. Look. Yeah? yeah? What do you mean? Well, now, if you'll examine it closely, you'll see traces of a stain. Annie, isn't that where I, I spill the ink in, uh, 
Well, let's see. It's uh, uh, about 1929, right? Why, Glenny, do you remember that? Well, I certainly do. You you spanked me with a hairbrush. <laughs> well, the accused has paid his debt to society. Case dismissed. Oh, Glenny, that stain is worth more to me than the tapestry itself. Oh, now, Annie. <laughs> I think she means it, Glendon. Your rival's already made her look ten years younger. Oh, how absolutely absurd. In fact, Delia, I think you could get up out of that chair this minute and trounce me soundly at a game of tennis. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't any doubt about it. I was in. And Delia's health improved so rapidly that I realized I'd have to think of a way to speed things up. That meant that I had to get Mrs. Parker, the housekeeper, out of the house for good. So I began devising little things to make her appear inefficient. Auntie wasn't supposed to have spices, so I sneaked in the kitchen and doctored the food up with pepper. After Mrs. Parker set the heating unit for the night, I got up and turned it off. Auntie woke up freezing, and Mrs. Parker became so confused and upset that she began helping me out by forgetting things and making mistakes all her own. Then, one afternoon... Uh, Glenny, I know Mrs. Parker means well, but as Dr. Davis says, I got to have someone I can depend on at all times. Well, I haven't liked to say anything. After all, she's been with you for so long, but, uh, well, the, the poor old soul needs a rest. It's going to be difficult to tell her. Well, now, I'll attend to that, Auntie, and I'll, I'll see about getting another housekeeper, an intelligent, capable, younger woman. <laughs> Rena, this is me. Huh? You know, Mr. Braley. Oh, yes. How are you? Great. Now, listen, kid. I'm calling from Santa Barbara. Yeah? Get up here right away. Check in at the San Martin Hotel as Rena Derwin. Right. And, and wait there till I call you. We're in, baby, but good. <laughs> Autolite is bringing you Mr. Van Heflin in Murder of Aunt Delia. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Oh, Mr. Wilcox, Hap asked me to return this book to you. Your life story, he said. Oh, you mean Wilcox of Wide Gap? Mm -hmm. ah, that's a great yawn. Uh, yarn. You'd like to hear one of the more electrifying episodes? Oh, sure. All right, listen. There it stood, a huge green monster. I'd been trailing it for weeks. Taking a wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plug from my pocket, I sprang forward. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Look, I cried out, you obstinate, obdurate auto, it's time you switch to these Autolite resistor spark plugs. You will idle smoother, run better on leaner gas mixtures, save gas. Another thing, your narrow-gap spark plugs have been messing up television reception around town. But with white gap auto light resistor spark plugs, you'll reduce to an acceptable level spark plug interference with radio and television. And what's more, auto light resistor spark plugs with that exclusive built-in 10,000 ohm auto light resistor give you 200% longer electrode life. So get white gap auto light resistor spark plugs. Get them right now. Remember, you're always right with auto light. And now auto light brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star Van Heflin. In Murder of Aunt Delia, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. By the time Rena arrived in Santa Barbara, I had fixed up a set of references of her ability and character that would have flattered Florence Nightingale and Susan B. Anthony. Rena came out for an interview, pretending she was sent by an employment agency I was supposed to have called. She made a terrific impression on the old lady. At a nod from me, Auntie hired Rena on the spot. And Mrs. Parker left with a cardboard suitcase, a month's pay, red eyes, and the sniffles. After we got Auntie to bed that first night, Rena and I met out on the veranda. How was I? George? Shh, shh, shh. That name. Nobody's around to hear. Well, don't take any chances. Call me Mr. Braley all the time. All right. Mr. Braley. How did I do? Perfect. Come on, let's walk out by the bluff and away from the house. 
Oh, this is sure some layout. <laughs> Looks great in the moonlight. It'll all be ours, baby. You mean to plan to live here after it's all over? Oh, maybe for a little while. Depends on how long it takes me to convert her estate to cash. Uh, we can't do anything to excite suspicion, you know. No. No. Right up ahead there is a cliff. A 200-foot drop onto some rocks. You're going to push her? Oh, no, no. Nothing as brutal as that. It's an accident. You take Aunt Delia out for an airing in her wheelchair. As you're pushing the chair, you trip and you fall. The chair starts rolling. You run after, but poor Auntie goes over the edge. You are hysterical with shock. Yeah? What's wrong with you taking Auntie for an airing? Look, if I could do it, what would be the point of you being here at all? Look, you're just an employee and brand new one. You have no reason on earth for croaking her for a dough. They just might get that idea if I was wheeling her, see? Mm, I guess you're right. And, and, and that's why it's important for us not to have much to do with each other. It's going to be difficult, though. Uh, Mr. Braley. No one can see us now, honey. Look, baby, now, let's not form any habits that it'll be tough to break. Just one kiss? Please. We not come on, stop that, you little oh, baby. The next afternoon, Auntie and I were in the library. I was trying to look interested in the scrapbook she was pouring through. I hoped she wouldn't notice how fidgety I was. My eyes are so weak now, Glennie, but I know every detail of these just from memory. <laughs> Here you are on your first tricycle. <laughs> well, I'll be darned. Is I ever that small? <laughs> it doesn't seem possible, does it? Oh, here's what I was looking for. The cow you drew when you were nine. Huh? You were quite the artist. Yeah, that's great. I was a surrealist or something. I colored it green. <laughs> Green cow on purple grass. It caused quite a sensation at your yeah, school. It's a wonder I wasn't expelled. Oh, Glenny. I've always been just sick about this picture. One of the few of you and me together. You broke away from me just as the photographer took it. Yeah, I'm just a blur. Say, so what's the cat doing in it? Oh, don't you remember? That's Xerxes. Don't you remember? Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, oh Xerxes, they, they Persian. <laughs> Gee, the fun that he and I used to have together. Uh, of course, I, I used to tease him a lot when you weren't looking, but he sure was a... Uh, he, uh... What's the matter, Auntie? Lenny, are you trying to fool your old auntie? What do you mean? You were frightened plumb out of your wits by cats. If Xerxes so much as brushed up against you, you'd scream bloody murder. That's why you jumped when the picture was taken. Oh, yeah, yeah, I did, didn't I? Yeah, I... I... You were that way when you first came here. Don't you remember? Poor old Dr. Thompson. He said it was a deep-seated phobia, and you'd probably have it all your life, like Napoleon. Did it go away, Glennie, this, uh, this fear of cats? Well, uh, most of it. Uh, you know, a guy sort of, uh, he doesn't like to remember what a coward he was when he was a kid. <laughs> Maybe she was satisfied with that explanation, but I, I thought she watched me a lot closer after that with her dim old eyes. Rena and I couldn't put it off much longer. I might make a real break. That night, Rena and I set it up. I said, uh, tomorrow, right after breakfast. Well, you'll come with me, won't you? No, honey, look, it'll be better if I'm not around. But you don't have to be right there. Just be where I can see you. I couldn't do it all alone. I don't know. All right, all right, but don't lose your nerve, kid. Now, don't lose your nerve. I didn't sleep much that night. The next morning, Rena and I got the old lady in her wheelchair. There you are, Auntie. Yes, sir. Thank you, Lenny. My, but isn't it a lovely day? It certainly is, Mrs. Farnham. Perhaps I'd better have a scarf over my head. I'll run upstairs and get one. Would you mind, dear? Uh, hey, there, there are two scarves uh, here on the sofa. Oh, never mind, Miss Derwin. There's some down here. Oh, all right. Which one do you want, Eddie? The uh, green and red one or the uh, blue and yellow? Why, uh, oh, oh, it doesn't matter, Glenny. Either one. Well, this one I think will go better with that robe you're wearing. Yes, so it will. Well, come on, let's go. Wait. I've... 
I've changed my mind. What? You mean about going out? Yes, yes, it's, it's so much bother. Bother? Oh, nothing. You, you, you need some fresh air, I'll Annie. just sit here by the open window. Well, look, you, you need some sun. Come along, Miss Derwin. Please, Kenny. I, I don't want to go. I just want to stay here and rest. Please. Well, yeah, sure, Andy, okay, if you don't want to go. Addie finally calmed down, but she still had Rena put her to bed. Then she asked me to drive to town to get her some medicine she was out of. I was hoping the old lady was coming down with something that would save Rena and me the trouble of that last wheelchair ride, but no. Next morning was cloudy and sultry. When I got downstairs, Rena already had the old girl out on the lawn in her wheelchair. She came over to me and whispered, She just wants to stay there, Dorian. No ride. Well, that's tough. She's going anyway. Come on, Rena. I suppose she makes a fuss. I think two of us can handle an old lady in a wheelchair. But if she screams. So what? This estate's as isolated as Alcatraz. Come on now, let's get it over with. All right. It's starting to sprinkle. Well, hurry up. Let's finish this before we get wet. Lenny, Miss Derwin, it's starting to rain. Yes, yes, we're coming, I Addie. I knew it would rain today. I knew it. Sure, sure. Well, here, here we go, Addie. You came just in time. I, I thought you'd forgotten me. Forget you, Addie? Well, don't be silly. Oh, my, it's starting to come down. Hurry or we'll be soaked. Lenny, the house is back that now, way. Just relax, Annie. Rena, help me push her, will you? Sure. Come on, let's make this quick. Come on, faster. Glenny, what are you doing? Stop it. Not too fast. Glenny, do you hear? I'm frightened. Head her for the cliff. You're not my Glenny, are you? You're not my Glenny. Okay, Rena. Stop me. Let her go. Please. It was done. I looked over the edge to make sure. She was dead, all right. I made Rena tear her hose and skin her knee, and I rubbed some dirt on the wound. It's raining hard now. As we got back to the house, I, I heard a car swerving around the last turn on the grade. It pulled up the driveway by the porch, and a man got out. It was Crittenden. Rena. Yes? Get hysterical, Rena. And limp. Huh? Uh, uh, Mr. Huh? Crittenden! Mr. Crittenden! <laughs> What are you doing? <laughs> Where's your auntie? Oh, something awful has happened. I was just going to phone to you. I tried to catch you. My, my, what's wrong? Well, my, my aunt is dead. Oh, Jesus. Yes, she... It's not my fault. No, Mrs. Not Derwin, stop that. It's not your fault. Well, what's happening? Aunt Delia, ask Mrs. Derwin to, to wheel her out over there so she could admire the view. In this rain? Well, no, it wasn't raining then. Mrs. Derwin tripped and the wheelchair coasted downhill. She oh. tried to catch up, but it, it plunged over the cliff with Annie. And, oh, good Lord! And I, I, I just stepped out to tell Miss Derwin she'd better bring Annie into the house. And Miss Derwin tripped just oh, as... Call an there. ambulance! Maybe there's still a chance! <laughs> Crittenden ran down to peek over the cliff, and I went into the library and phoned the ambulance and the police, too, just to make it look good. I was downing a double shot of bourbon when the lawyer came in. Uh, that poor woman, at least she didn't suffer. Oh, thank heavens for that. Uh, use a drink? No, thank you. No. It's quite a shock. I'll, I'll never forget that, that scream but when she... don't torture yourself. This young woman, uh... What's her background? Miss Derwin? Why, an employment agency sent her out. Uh-huh, yes. I, uh... It wasn't carelessness on her part, Mr. Gritton, and it, it might have happened to anyone. If it hadn't been for the slope to the edge of that cliff, she'd have caught Auntie in time. I know Gentlemen, she would... Gentlemen, I've lost control of myself. I'm uh, sorry. Miss Derwin, this is uh, Mr. Crittenden, uh, Mrs. Farnham's uh, attorney. How do you do? Mrs. Farnham has spoken of you on the phone. Could I bring you gentlemen anything? No, nothing for me, thank you, thank you. Why don't you sit down and relax? You've had quite a shock. Yes, sit down, Miss Derwin. Thank you. Well, yes, seems to be nothing to do, but just wait. <laughs> I'm a fuss budget about these things, perhaps, but that bust of Shakespeare on the bookcase, isn't it in rather a precarious position? Well, I uh, never noticed it. Uh, right over your head there. <laughs> Makes me nervous. I'll, I'll just slide it back. Rather... Top heavy thing. Look out, door! What? Oh my, oh. that was close. 
barely missed you. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, no, no harm is done. Lucky you had the presence of mind to call out, Miss Dillon. What was it you called, Mr. Brayley? Why, I, I didn't call him anything. I just told look him out, to... Dort. It was what you said. Why did you call him Dort? Why, I well, it was it. just a, an exclamation. She saw the statue topple over. Oh, and, and called she... you by your real name, hmm? Mr. Gritton, and I, I'm afraid I don't quite see the reason for this, uh, this peculiar questioning. I'm sure that my poor aunt would resent your prying into the affairs I'm of the household. I'm afraid you're mistaken. This prying, as you call it, is made at your aunt's request. What do you mean? She telephoned me yesterday afternoon to tell me about a strange doubt, a suspicion. About what? About you. Me? Why should she, she have any... She was disturbed by the horrible feeling that you are an imposter. And he thought that... I... Well, that, that's, that's absurd. Your recollections of your childhood here were quite convincing, except for one or two things. Well, this is all very... <laughs> oh, 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 my fear of cats. Well, people do get over childish phobias. After all, It's that's more than that, Sim. Remember a drawing she showed you? The watercolor of a cow? Sure, sure, the, the green cow. What about it? And the scars. Remember you thought the blue and yellow would go better with her robe than the red and the green one? Well, so what? Doesn't it strike you as peculiar that a boy who could draw quite a fine cow should paint it green? And then years later be so exacting about harmonizing his aunt's scarf? You see, Glendon Braley was colorblind. <laughs> Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Van Heflin. Well, Mr. Wilcox, before I go, do you suppose I could get Van Heflin's autograph? Why, I don't think he'd mind, would you, Van? Well, not at all. How would you like me to sign it, miss? Well, would you just write yours for A-L-R-S-P? A-L-R-S-P? Uh-huh. Autolite resistor spark plugs. How do I get mixed up with these commercial <laughs> characters? <laughs> well, she can't help it, Van. No one can help admiring those irreproachable, irrepressible, irrefragibly superior spark plugs that mean smoother engine idle, smoother performance on leaner gas mixtures actually save gas. Autolite resistor spark plugs are just one of the more than 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats made by Autolite in its 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, coils, distributors, generators, starting motors. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz will be our stars. The play is called Red-Headed Woman. And it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in Suspense. Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Murder of Aunt Delia is an original play by Lou Houston. Van Heflin appeared by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Producers of Battleground, starring Van Johnson, John Hodiak, Ricardo Montalban, and George Murphy. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Burt Lancaster, Mickey Rooney, and Ida Lupino. Don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. Buy Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite staple batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.